Alright, ladies and gentlemen, how you feeling out there? Alright, start applauding, start going crazy, and welcome to the stage, Damien Power! Thank you, thank you. Thursday night, let's kick it! Woo! Listen to that, fuck yeah, thanks so much for coming out, huge night of comedy tonight. Um, yep, you like the suit? Yeah! yeah. Okay, too much. Um, <laughs> likes it too much. That's uh, it's an aggressive yeah. Yes! Fuck yes, I love it! Good, you're going to love this show, man. Thanks for coming. Um, it, it makes a huge difference. Thank you all for coming. It makes a huge difference. Um, yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, was, that was the joke. Anyway, um, no, I have been running the show in Adelaide, so I'm used to that kind of thing. But uh, No, I did. I read it in Adelaide in a fucking tent next to a Ferris wheel. So whenever I bombed, you could hear people having more fun outside. And really enjoying themselves and stuff. Um, nothing, nothing too heavy this year, sort of light and fun stuff, that's part of it. I sort of want to get, you know, I sort of want to start appealing to more people as a comedian. I, I put the suits part of it as well, sort of changing my dress and stuff. It's sort of a nice uh, uh, deep purple, quite, quite a feminine colour, uh, this purple. I, I, believe, I believe men are going to become uh, more feminine as culture moves on. I believe men will become more feminine. Now, I personally, gentlemen, feel that, uh, you know, I see liberation in that. I do. I, uh, for example, I have a friend of mine who's very camp <clears throat> and, and straight. He's camp and straight. Does anyone have that friend? Yeah, yeah you know the guy's like, oh my god, when are the girls getting here? Seriously. <laughs> what? When's Bianca getting here? Seriously. She's fucking hot. It's like, dude, you're straight. How the fuck does this work? Like, I remember my mate, he, I've known him since primary school. He's, he was born camp. Born camp. Not gay. Born camp. Even as a kid, he's like, woo! Like, that means campness is genetic. How have we evolved campness? What's the evolutionary purpose in campness? Was there a tribe running from a tiger? And one dude was like, woo tiger! Over here! The tiger's like, whoa, fuck, run, he's wearing leopard skin. Go, go. <laughs> I, uh, I believe we're meant to be camp as men. I do, I believe we're meant to be camp. I think that's our natural state. Uh, if you look at the male of any species, they're camp. Um, look at the peacock. Yeah, the peacock, that's the dude, by the way. Woo, yes! <laughs> Woo! Seen the woman as a little brown. Good night, mate. How are you? Good to see you. <laughs> like a truck driver. Good night, mate. Good to see you. <laughs> Woo! Yes! <laughs> We're meant to be campers, man. That's our natural. Pl you look at the Restoration era. Look at the Victorian era. We wore ruffles and makeup and wigs and tights. Shakespeare wrote plays. Really camp <laughs> with a feather to be or not to be. Oh, the tight and chairs are camp as fuck. For some reason, there was a change in culture, man. You know, there was a shift. You see it in commercial advertising. For some reason, there was this change where men became, oh, I've got a, oh, I've got a fucking truck. <laughs> I got bricks. I'm a man. I got bricks and a hammer. For some reason, that's what it became about. You can actually see. You can see the cultural confusion. You can see it in Irish dancing. <laughs> you can, you can see, because the top half's like, what are you looking at? The bottom half's like, woo! <laughs> Stop it, legs, you poor, woo! Ah! <laughs> you can actually see the internal battle. <laughs> I see liberation in campness. I think, you know, I see liberation. And when I was watching the horror film that came out recently, by the dude who did get out, I went and watched that with my camp mate. He's emoting. He's emoting during it, going, oh, oh, oh. like this little shit. And I'm sitting there fucking keeping it all in <laughs> so I can drive my ute off a cliff years later. <laughs> I believe in the matriarchy. Yeah, no, there I said it. Yeah, I believe in it. I think, um, you know, men don't like to hear that sometimes, but I believe society would be better if it was run by women. I think it would be better for men. I know, I know, 
Hear me out. Yeah, we're just waiting. Um, <laughs> Um, no, I, do, I actually, honestly, I believe it's extremely, uh, extremely patronising that that uh, the men think there couldn't be a uh, couldn't be a matriarchy. Do you know what a matriarchy is, sweetheart? Is that <laughs> the okay, some of them are. Yeah, no, it can be patronising. It can be very patronising. It can be patronising, which I hate. <laughs> She's a doctor, is she? <laughs> now, look what you've done, mate. I just did a really nice joke and you just... <laughs> just go... <laughs> I'm trying my best up here, mate. <laughs> don't let the suit fool you. I don't know what's going on. Um, I actually base it on science. Did you hear Yeah, I do. The, the, the bonobo chimp. You've heard of this chimp? It's a primate species. The society is run by women, gangs of women. And it's the most peaceful primate on the planet, more peaceful than us. And the women run society by ganging up on the men if they have to. And they resolve conflict not with violence, but with sex. <laughs> yeah, they do. They gang up on the men. If the men's like, oh, they just jerk him off. He's like, oh, what was I thinking? And he's like, oh, and society just flows. It just works. <laughs> fun sort of material at the top there, wasn't it? That was sort of fun, we're having a good time and so on. Um, but, uh, you know, if you've seen me before, often I have a pseudo-intellectual wanky through line through the show, uh, or, you know, a dark story. Um, but not this year. I'm not doing that this year. I, I, I want to get on commercial TV. <laughs> no, I do. I, I sort of really honestly feel a tremendous urge to get bigger as a comedian. I, I need to start, you know, I've been doing it for 14 years. I want to get, I want to get the broader Australia. You know, I don't want the inner city left leaning middle class elite. But, you know, <laughs> you know, uh, honestly, thank you for coming. But, <laughs> I want to start getting the broader sort of, you know, the, oh, married at first sight, that's good, like that kind of thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, the, oh, you know, the reason democracy is failing, I want those people to come in as Western civilization crumbles, I'm like, come into the Colosseum and see my lighter, more fun material. <laughs> that's what I want. I, do, I want that. You know, like I saw, I, I supported Husey recently and I watched a fan go up to him and go, Husey, you're the funniest cunt. <laughs> when am I going to get him? <laughs> when is he going to come to my show? You know, <laughs> like last year's show was dark and not funny. <laughs> like it was sad and emotional and not funny as well. So you just leave people leave the theatre going, what's what happened? Like, it's just not a good way to send people into the world. Like, oh, that was shit, and I'm sad. So. <laughs> You know, I had a TV producer come up to me after the show last year and go, I love the show, I saw it tonight, and you know, I, I, um, would you be interested in writing on a drama series about murder-suicide? <laughs> That's true. What a thing to take out of a comedy show. He'd be great writing about murder-suicide. Get him in. So, uh, so this year I, uh, <coughs> I really do um, <coughs> want to keep it light and keep it fun and, and not get bogged down in, in, in the, uh, the pseudo-intellectual, anything too, too deep. I, I did want to make the show about Plato's allegory of the cave. <laughs> um, which is the idea that if a man was born into a cave, imprisoned in it, and only ever saw the shadows of reality on the cave wall, he would believe the shadows to be reality not knowing the real world exists outside the cave and would be absolutely compelled by the shadows and eventually he escapes the shadows in the cave and enters the real world seeing the deeper truth and you know you could almost argue that um, our dreams and beliefs are sort of like shadows on the cave wall aren't they they're compelling illusions that we believe will fulfill us but prevent us from seeing the deeper truth <coughs> outside the cave but but not this year i uh, i uh Definitely want to avoid that nonsense at all, at all costs. So keep it light, lots of fun material this year. Seen the trams? <laughs> Who's been on a tram before? <laughs> seen the trams? Yeah. Um, I have seen the trams. Not very good at observational comedy, to be honest. Though. But I, I, I have literally seen them, and uh, and there's a process applied, but I, I which I haven't done. But I have seen, seen them. I've seen them. Um, I, uh, you know, it's sort of more relatable stuff as well. You know, like, you know, I want to keep the energy up and light and fun and not get bogged down. Uh, you know, family, family's very relatable. Hence, have you ever been a member of a family? 
<laughs> loads in here, so uh, loads of people see it, so this stuff will go well. Um, my family's a waterfall of trauma. <clears throat> Starts with my granddad, he came back from World War II and he came back from that unimaginable horror. And grandma was like, what happened? He was like, oh, nothing. <laughs> I'm fine! And just sat under the house. And he took all of that trauma and passed it on to my dad. So dad just grew up in a state of panic. My dad's just fueled by panic. He's like, what's going on? Where are we? Where the fucking, where'd you park the door? Where's the car? Where's the fucking car? That's what I grew up with. My dad's just always going, what's going on? Where'd you put it down? Let's go there. Where'd you pay? Ah! Just running, my dad. My dad's running through life. Dad treats life like a job to get done. You get bored, you grow up, you meet someone, you get married, you retire, dead, good, done. <laughs> Thank fucking God that life job's done. <laughs> right, now that life's out of the way, what's next? <laughs> Looks like the afterlife needs a mow. <laughs> Let's mow the afterlife, get the next job done. That's why my dad never gets depressed. He never gets depressed, my dad. It's funny, it's fascinating because he's always going. He won't get me life I'm fucking going. He's going too quick to get depressed. You know, I wish I was like that, you know, just fucking running through life, leaving a wake of mentally ill children behind me. <laughs> That's the kind of environment we grew up in. Me and my brothers, four boys, regional Queensland, in a family obsessed with motorsport and, 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 and rugby league. You know, it was a very tense, competitive environment. I'm, to give you an idea what my parents are like, both of them fuel each other's neurosis. They fuel each other, they egg each other on. Like, I remember I brought bringing my son up, I was feeding my son porridge, I put jam on the porridge to make it sweeter. My son didn't eat much. Then for some, this is how my parents work. Dad comes down and goes, oh, it looks like Patrick hasn't eaten much. My, my mum goes, oh yeah, why doesn't he eat more? Dad doesn't feed him enough. You're right, no, that's really bad. Yeah, he's probably gonna fucking starve. <laughs> then, I don't know if you've ever been attacked by someone eating porridge. But my dad fucking runs at me in the hallway going, Dad, why is it Patrick eating more fucking porridge? He's eating it at me. He's eating it so it doesn't go to waste. Why is he eating more fucking porridge? Why don't you put a bit of honey on it? Oh, I put jam on it, Dad. Oh, fucking jam! Genuinely angry at the condiment. Jam! Why would you choose jam? That's the kind of shit I grew up going, oh, fuck what? Honey's more important than jam. Honey's more important than jam. Super, so we're all like, all oh, me and my brothers are in this race. Dad started us in, like, go! We're fucking in this, you know, and this it was a very, it's a very competitive environment, very tense childhood. And I remember, you know, people talk about escape. And I said, I remember, so I started smoking pot when I was 13. Yeah, I remember looking out the window, like, I knew I was smoking too much. I remember looking out the window at the family hose. <laughs> and the hose had gotten so short. <laughs> for me making bongs out of it. The dad was like, where's the fucking hose? You used to go to the fucking fence. <laughs> Kicks this year as well. Um, that's true, yeah, that's where we grew up around. And um, you know, now I'm trying to understand my dad and why me, me and my brothers are so fucked up. And uh, I was like, dad, what was your relationship like with your dad? He goes, oh, dang, that's all bullshit. What's my dad got to do with me? I don't know, Dad. Did he ever say anything to you that maybe may have impacted you? He goes, oh, I don't know, Dad. One time he said it was his biggest disappointment. I'm like, dude, that's significant. No. That's why I don't blame my parents at all. I don't, I don't look back at my childhood like, was something wrong or anything because compared to their parents they fucking killed it <laughs> they fucking killed it i'm from the generation that got hit as kids i don't mean we got it was bad or anything i just mean if we were naughty we got hit that's the generation i'm from my dad would be like that's nothing <laughs> my dad used to whip us with a belt and now i'm a parent i'd never hit my son but sometimes when i raise my voice he cries and I'm like, that's nothing. <laughs> my dad used to hit us. And when my son has kids, and they're floating in a weird technology orb, <laughs> uh, like there's all these screens, like, oh, 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 oh. it's like porn and movies and chats, and, uh, just a media orb, uh, 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 drooling, uh, it's a food straw. Uh, 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 uh. 
and my son looks at his son and he's like, Daddy, don't look at me. That's a violent visual attack. <laughs> You'd be like, that's nothing. My dad used to raise his voice sometimes. <laughs> oh my God, the horror. <laughs> We just think we're so fucking like our generation's like, oh, this is it, we've worked it out. Do you remember teaching your parents how to use a smartphone? And they'd send you a picture of their fucking neck, like this area? <laughs> you didn't know how to use it? And we're like, oh, you fucking idiots. <laughs> you wait. They're working on a chip that connects your brain to the internet. We're gonna be the ones. Her fucking granddad sent me a telepathic hologram today. It's just him going barbecue, 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 barbecue. You gotta bleep before the intercept thought, you fucking idiot. <laughs> Every generation the music gets worse and worse. Doesn't it? Until we're grandparents and music has become the sound of human excrement landing in water. <laughs> the kids are like <laughs> that in the fucking bud right now. You don't follow your dreams, you escape into them. A dream, your dreams are a place you hide from a deeper struggle. No one's ever achieved anything without, achieved their dreams without immense struggle. You hide in your dreams. My brother won the Indy 500. He drove so fast in a circle he won. <laughs> Look at him following his dreams. Ah! 400Ks an hour. Ah! People have literally died around him. Ah! Gotta have the fastest circle. I'm following my dreams. I want the 
across the circle. Ah! I'll sacrifice everything for that circle. It's so beautiful, following your dreams. Are there any willpower fans in? No, we rarely draw the same audience, to be honest. There's not much of a motorsport crossover for me. Um, like, when, when you do the Adelaide Fringe, they have the Clipsal 500 on at the same time as the Arts Festival. So often people come to see me because of my name, how I look, and will. And one year I just did this for the show. That was like, great fucking show. Finally, someone who looks like Will and is a car. Love it. <laughs> my, brother, uh, my brother Will is now the greatest driver in the history of the entire sport. When you play the PlayStation game, he's the dude you select. <laughs> I select him and drive repeatedly into the wall. <laughs> to overcome childhood trauma. Um, that's a different issue. Uh, but, um, you know, he said something really interesting to me. He said, because uh, he's been racing his entire life, <coughs> since he was about six, and he said, when I win now, I pretend my hand is hurt, so I don't have to shake so many people's hands. <laughs> so we've all got problems, haven't we? <laughs> a lot of you probably don't know about congratulations fatigue. It is a new thing. It's, can be, oh, you know, it can be, oh, oh, the fame and the money, oh, oh. stop it. Um, my brother, Nick, left, left a Toowoomba at age 13 to be a break dancer in regional Queensland. A break dancer. Dad used to call it cockhead dancing. <laughs> Go on and do your cockhead dancing, are you, Nick? Spinning on your head like a cockhead. Dad would always pull me so I go, Nick's going off and doing his cock hair dancing. Don't you get into that? <laughs> so supportive. <laughs> now Nick tours the world with dance theatre shows he's created, critically acclaimed in Europe and so on. Dad's like, all right, you got me. <laughs> I didn't believe in any of it or support any of it. I have no idea what you do, but well done. <laughs> I always felt that was hard for my brother and me, you know, because motorsport was so favoured in our family because Dad was a racing car driver. So no one really understood the arts thing. Because motorsport, there's no interpretation. Is there? It's like, he won, line. Ah, line, car, first. It's not like, did he metaphorically, or is it an idea? You know? It's just, line, first, car, good. Champion, trophy. It's such a simplistic, like, you know, it's a great. But, um... <laughs> but I'm just saying, like, it's, it's, you know, we grew up in Toowoomba, and art was not a thing. Honestly, it wasn't. When we grew up in Toowoomba, it was not a thing that was open to us. Like, I remember family barbecues, the favouritism. Like, Uncle, who do you think Uncle Greg wants to talk to at the family barbecue? World champion, Will Power, or my brother Nick, who's a dance theatre choreographer? <laughs> Go on, to Will, I'm good on you, Will. Great circle, that last one, mate. <laughs> Honestly, that last circle inspired me, if I'm honest, I, uh, I park differently <laughs> as a result of that circle. Going, well, what have you been up to, Nick? What have you been up to, young Nick? Well, Uncle Greg, I actually just recently created a postmodern dance theatre piece that explores the cultural differences between Indigenous communities and Cambodian communities through postmodern dance. <laughs> what, like the fucking footy? <laughs> no, 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 no it's, it's, it's like art. Did you fucking win? <laughs> you don't really win art, it's, it's about ideas. I fucking hate ideas. I hated art where I grew up, they fucking hated it. My principal of my high school was a former Australian rugby captain. Yeah, and he just employed his back line. All the staff were just his back line. My arts teacher was a former halfback. He didn't know anything about art. He just got the job because he was his mate's halfback. He, he, he taught the class like a footy match. He'd get us in a huddle, get in here, get around, get out there and fucking art! <laughs> get out there and fucking art like it matters! None of you's a fucking art! Paint a sculptor! Paint a swan! He, 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 he had brain damage, you couldn't say something. He meant swan, but he was, paint a swan! Smith, paint a swan, a black swan! Swan!
songs are beautiful. Get in here, have an orange. Have an orange. You always bought oranges to class. Have an orange. It's half time. An arts class. <laughs> and I'm um, I'm a stand-up comedian, obviously, and that's um that's uh that's no it's a cliche to even say that stand-up comedians are hiding from something. <laughs> we all know we're fucked up. Um, it's everyone in society knows comedians are fucked up, you know. And uh, I um well, you know I was I, I felt tremendous pressure to be somebody in my family because my brothers were getting famous. Nick was touring and Will was on, in, doing Bathurst and so on. And I was like, fuck, I've got to be somebody. I've got to. And, uh, you know, where do you go when you're your most desperate? And, uh, you know, I signed up to an open mic night. Um, uh, you know, one of the most depraved acts you can possibly do. And, um, oh, well, you know, I don't know if you've ever been to an open mic night, but it wouldn't surprise me if it was a, a government initiative. <laughs> sort of get the vocal lunatics off the street, you know, get them in, get them in one place. Get them in one area. You know, as someone who frequency open mic nights, I have tremendous empathy for raving lunatics because we're so close as comedians to raving lunatics we're this close like just put my act on the street now without a mic oh run 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 circles he won't run run i can break it ah ah excuse me the money <laughs> in a fucking good gig. We're that close. We are, have friends that are so on the fucking fringe in comedy. It's fucking unbelievable. We're, we're a bad couple of years away from just being on the street going, anyway, I was on the bus the other day. You know, with this close. You know, I saw a raving lunatic screaming in a bin today. You know, going, oh, fuck you, Ben, you're having a go at me, you fucking dog, like yelling at this bin. Everyone's like, oh my god, I'm like, Lee, he's, he's working out a bin. <laughs> Let him work it out. He's trialing some new shit on the fucking bin, you fucking. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, Will Anderson's a good bloke, but. <laughs> no, it's a, that's, that's, a, that's not a, yeah. That's the kind of joke you say when you're you know, trying to appeal to a broader audience. And, uh, it's a shame because, you know, I, I feel bad because Will Anderson is actually a tremendous supporter of live comedy. He actually goes to New Comedians gig. When I started, he came and he gave me notes. He tweeted out my show and so on and plugged it and, you know. But, to be clear, he was the dude at the bin. <laughs> so, there's sort of both. But, um... <laughs> no, I felt a tremendous pressure to sort of be somebody, and to become something in my family, and you could almost argue that you know, <laughs> me and my family's dreams, they're like the shadows on the cave wall, you know, they're compelling illusions to fulfilment, but the deeper truth that we're not confronting outside the cave is our toxic childhood. But you know, anyway, look, no, let's keep it up, Pete. Let's keep it up, Pete, you know what I mean? Let's see, you can already feel the mood's lost. I've gone into some pseudo-intellectual wanky shit and already everyone's like, dude, just do the fucking jokes. You know what I mean? It's so tempting, isn't it? Just to shoehorn that sort of stuff into your show. And um, that's why I like Joel Creasy. Joel Creasy keeps it up, baby. He, he, he dances during his shows, I assume. I've never watched it. <laughs> I've never watched, but I um, I'm like, oh, I gotta, but yeah, um, no, it does look like a lot of fun, and uh, you know, I think my act would be better if I danced a bit more, you know, like the fart song seemed to really lift um, the crowd, you know, like I, I saw a scene, you know, this is the kind of shit I want to get into because I, you know, I think like people having a better time, more people will, will come and stuff, they don't have to think, and I, um, you know, you know what I mean, like, you know, you don't want comedy to be heavy, that's all I'm saying, you know, like I saw a sound effects comic, you ever seen them, they have loop pedals, not them. They make sounds and shit and imitate. That's fun, isn't it? They're never dark. They're never like... <laughs> I have repetitive intrusive thoughts. <laughs> can't sleep. I can't sleep. Anxiety. I can't sleep. I keep thinking about something I did when I was seven. <laughs> Seriously, I fucking... I can't fucking sleep! Hype man? Saw a hype man in Cairns recently supporting a DJ. A hype man is an actor that doesn't have an act. He just hypes the crowd up. It's fucking great. It's just pure fun. It's just, yeah, put your hands up. Come on. Yeah, come on now. I can't hear you. We're having a good time. Yeah, let the beat drop. Fun shit.
shit. He's never talking about mental illness. Come on, yeah! I say social, you say anxiety. Social! Social! Yeah! Depraved thoughts! Never, you know, they're never like, put your hands in the air, God is dead. Put your hands in the air because God is dead. It's been replaced by consumerism. God is dead. Come on. God is dead. Yeah, God is dead. <laughs> I mean, God is dead, you know. It's a fair point. Uh, there is no central moral authority in society anymore that dictates how we should be a good people or whatever, you know. It's, the hype man makes, it, <laughs> makes a good point. <laughs> well, no, God is dead, honestly. If you go up to... A priest now even and go, you know, do you believe in God? They're like, of course not, obviously. But you know, like, you know, you know they'll pull you aside, look, yeah, we've got to believe in something. It's, we're all having a laugh. Look, you know. <laughs> obviously there's not a God, science has disproved it, but we've got to keep the thing going. <laughs> no, seriously, you know. <laughs> do you think Cardinal Pell's praying? Like, God, he's like, what am I doing? <laughs> Just give me the lawyer. <laughs> Dear God, I'm like, what the uh, it's true, you know, like, people hide in their dreams, you know, we hide in our dreams to escape deeper problems, you know, people hide in their beliefs, exactly the same thing. Have you ever, have someone in your social circle who's hardcore into their beliefs, like hardcore into them, they're not well, are they? <laughs> Think about the person in your social group that's like, the one that's like, this, they're never well, because they're hiding, they're hiding in their beliefs, you know, like, have you ever met a conspiracy theorist who's got a good life? <laughs> a conspiracy theorist has got a good life. Like, yeah, I'm married with kids, um, love my wife, love my kids, love my property, I've got a house, I've paid off, I've got loads of hobbies, ultimate frisbee, <laughs> ultimate frisbee competition, which is run by the Jews. <laughs> yeah, by the lizard people. <laughs> or whatever, you know, it's never that, is it? All my conspiracy theory mates are always drinking spaghetti out of a tin. One of them said to me recently, he's like, man, the reason I can't get an erection is because of Monsanto. I'm like, interesting. Um, what products? Anyway, uh, no, people, people, really, people that lives are really fucked hiding beliefs as well. We all do it to different degrees. I, I infiltrate One Nation support groups on Facebook. You know, their lives are fucking chaos. Like, they're just a mess. But they've got a belief to hide in. They post things like, oh, my wife ate hummus, now she's a lesbian. <laughs> Explain that. Explain it. One guy was like, oh, my car broke down because the oil's halal. <laughs> Used to be Dick Smith's blood. But yeah, as both sides of politics, we have tremendous trouble dealing with the systemic problems of our society. Like you can't, like climate change, you can't blame that on Islam. They try. One dude was like, oh, you don't get it, mate, the kebab smoke forms pockets. <laughs> <laughs> That's the same as the other side of politics. I mean, we all talk about the left being, you know, social justice warriors online. It's almost like a vanity project now, being a social justice warrior, isn't it? They get, I, I picture a, a social justice warrior, someone just getting their phone out and just like, Instagram, just going, yeah, racism, shit. <laughs> so they get social credit from just, yeah, it's, bad things are bad, just think of it. Just follow me if you can. You know what I mean? It's become like a vanity prize, it's like a narcissistic thing. It's not like it's, nothing is sacrificed, it's just like, it's shit, shit's shit. <laughs> but we, we, we're very hard, you know, like people, that, oh, the, you know, the left have done nothing, you know, the right are in power and have changed all the rules, so everything's so shifted far to the right that no one can do anything about it and we're totally inactive and unable to make any effective change whatsoever. Um, but <laughs> we have done political correctness. You know, people underestimate but political correctness is a phenomenal achievement. We've changed the way people think and talk. That's fucking amazing. That's incredible. Like, I have thought crimes now. <laughs> like, I saw a dog today, I'm like, oh, that dog is black, is that a racial attack on the dog? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I have thought, that's an amazing achievement. Like, the last time there were thought crimes is in Catholicism. Like, you couldn't cover your neighbour's ox, which is like, you're thinking about the ox, fucking ox, man. Have you seen this ox, man? Shit, it's off the hook. Like, you're thinking about the, you're thinking about the ox all the time, it's so big, man. It's like the, 
And you could go to a priest and the priest would be like, oh, how have you seen it? You go, oh, this ox, I can't stop thinking about it. The ox is incredible. And he could be like, oh, I do 10 Hail Marys, you're forgiven. And you'd be like, oh, thank God. And you've got this weight off you for your thought crime. We need that, we need that for political incorrectness. You know, we need, we need like a, a, a priest of the far left that we can confess our political incorrectness to. You know, like an, an inner city male feminist content creator. You know what I mean that you could go to and you'd be like, how have you politically incorrect you exactly this week? And you'd be like, oh, look, I, I, I sort of bowed at sushi train. <laughs> Incredibly offensive. Uh, retweet Clementine four or ten times. <laughs> and you're like, oh my god, I'm relieved. It's <laughs> honestly political greatness is an, an incredible achievement. Um, you know, it's changed the way we think and talk, and it's actually for the mostly for the better. You know, it's amazing. If we can apply that to systemic change. We can't put political correctness above systemic change. Can we? We can't. We, systemic change must. Like I saw an activist tweet this recently. I won't give white homeless people money because they dropped the white privilege ball. It had like thirty-seven thousand likes. That's putting. You can't be like, what are you doing? How'd you fuck this up? Seriously. <laughs> Man spreading all over the footpath. What's this? You know. You can't be like, also, like, you gotta go up to them and go, hey, you're white. Oh. Holy fuck, I'm white! What am I doing on the street? I'm white! Just run into an office building. I'm white! I'm white! I forgot I'm white! And they're like, oh, go straight to CEO. <laughs> the homeless CEO. No, oh, Qantas this week's got a new CEO. They've changed their business plan to just be big issue. That's all they're doing now. <laughs> the single biggest issue I think we face is, so, is, is wealth inequality, and we all... I think sort of know that wealth inequality now, you know, 60 people own as much as 3 billion. Yeah, it's, it's pretty significant, isn't it? Yeah, it's a weird reaction to make. He's like, he's, he's like one of them, he's like, yeah, it's sick, is that good? I've got a, I've got a spaceship, is this, is this gonna be about me? Um, I've been in the belly of the beast, man. I've seen your kind. I did a corporate for Lamborghini Corporation and uh, they called me up. I think they were like, Dad's brother! <laughs> cars, cars, brother, comedy! They called me up and they were like, we want you to do 20 minutes of stand-up for Lamborghini Corporation and Lamborghini owners. And I said, well, does the ruling elite deserve laughter? <laughs> or should I show them a slideshow of homelessness? And uh, they were like, yeah, that sounds funny. <laughs> Sounds hilarious. So I'm showing them the slideshow and it's fucking crushing. They laugh like this. It never trickles down. It never trickles down. It's never trickled. Who wants to be fucking trickled on anyway? Oh, thank you. The trickle. Oh, I'm replenished from the trickle. We just can't see, no one seems to have a solution to the growth economy. No one seems to be able to answer the problem. It almost feels like our, our, our beliefs now, you could almost argue, are like the, uh, the, the shadows on the cave wall. <laughs> are they? Yeah. Sorry. No, I fucked up that. Um, sorry, Johnny. Just wandering around the stage like, what are you doing it? <laughs> you know, like they're compelling in our beliefs. We hide in them. They're compelling. But we can't seem to be able to face the one problem on either side of politics is what the fuck are we going to do with the continual growth system on a finite planet? We face economic and environmental catastrophe. No, nah, all right. Okay. Who's been to a cafe recently? <laughs> I feel like cafes are beat, fun stuff, you know. Eating your superfoods, mate. Eating your superfoods. Who's there? Who goes, you ever eat acai berries? Give me them, Sai berries. You know, interesting thing I read about Sai berries, they actually worship as a god of life in, in the Amazon. This tribe to worship it and they gather it and they worship it as the source of life in all the forest. I ordered through Uber Eats <laughs> myself and a dude from Peru, like from the Amazon, brings it to me in a bowl for five bucks, crying, This is the source of all life. You know, good. Like, give me the fucking bowl, mate. One star, too political. <laughs> I don't want to hear all the shit. 
I'm alone in my Netflix cocoon. <laughs> they, want to, they want to make your house now so you don't have to leave it. You have a smart fridge, smart TV, phone, stereo, car, it all talks to each other, knows everything about you. So you come home from a date and your kettle's like, I wouldn't have said that. <laughs> you argue, fuck you, kettle, you having a go? The washing machine's like, boy, he's right, you know, you're a bit of a creep. Fuck you, washing machine siding with the kettle. Just wandering around your house. What'd you say, lamp? Just, oh, uh, like, you could die, no one would know. The fucking vacuum cleaner has to call the police. <laughs> Because, you know, the more material wealth we have, the less community. That's the sacrifice we've made. We have immense material wealth, but oh, shit. Like, people talk about white men as the privileged of society, but if you look at us, middle-aged white men are the most stiff, awkward, wet, alienated people. Like, we're always like, oh, I'm going to pick up my son from school, all the men stand around going, G'day, Roger, how are you? Good to see you. How's Tim? How's the, the veranda? <laughs> we're all just so, so we're so disconnected from community, earth, and name. We're just like, yeah, good. Uh, how, how's Rob? Yeah, it's a, how's the brand? The women are having a bit of a chin wag, aren't they? Because yeah. <laughs> we're so divorced from like community and ritual and that that, that humanness from material wealth that we're privileged from. Like if you saw forty white middle-aged men just hanging out in the park. <laughs> Something fucked is happening. <laughs> you know, like, look at them connecting, gathering, it's so beautiful, you're like, get back, kids. <laughs> Hello, police. Yeah, 40 of them. I've never seen just a whole park of people going, get out here, Roger. Tim, was it? I thought you were like, yeah, the missus is, yeah, no, I've got the car. Uh, ah! <laughs> <coughs> you notice that more when you have a kid, you know, because you realise how liberated we are when, we, when, we, when, when we're kids, you know, they're just free. They're like, I was standing the other day with another dad, Richard, was standing there doing that whole, yeah, the sun is hot sometimes. <laughs> and the kids are like, woo, just running around, woo, yeah. My son runs over and goes, Daddy, can Timmy have a sleepover? Just the joy for him where they're going, yeah. And he's like, can Timmy have, just a guy I just met, Timmy have a sleepover? Not for any malicious reason, just purely for friendship. Not because Timmy's desperate, dude. He said he'd let me fucking crash, man. I broke my brother's toy. Just let me fucking crash on your cow. Just pure human friendship. We're not doing that as adults. I'm not like, yes, of course Timmy can come for a sleepover. And what about you, Richard? Would you like to come for a sleepover? We can continue our stunted chat about China. <laughs> it's like this gap that we're missing in contentedness from, um, from, uh, oh, okay. So that was Richard. Um, <laughs> found me, fuck. Um, the gap we're missing in happiness from lack of community, antidepressants seem to fill now. Like, so many people are on antidepressants, they fill that gap. Of, of, you know, like, it wouldn't surprise me to get to the stage where you just get antidepressants at the McDonald's drive through <laughs> Just to make it more convenient, you can get a counselling session or whatever. Uh, how can I help you? Yeah, I'm feeling a bit low, to be honest, man. Um, <laughs> my boss at work makes me feel insignificant, to be honest. <laughs> so do you view him as an authority figure? <laughs> yeah, I do, actually. He's quite powerful in my eyes. <laughs> well, did you have a powerful figure in your childhood that maybe bullied you or whatever, or a, a brother or a father? Or, um, oh, yeah, my brother did bully me before he got famous. Uh, anyway. What's going on? Is that like running in and out? Back in and out. Yeah, well, uh, just go through to the next window and get your Zoloft shaker fries. <laughs> Sitting there shaking them next to a bridge. Oh, nothing! Clinical director's gone mad! You can't even kill yourself anymore! You gotta kill yourself, the council come, you can't kill yourself without a high vis shirt. <laughs> you need a permit to kill yourself, I just wanna kill myself! <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> I, this is how much value I put in my external things like stand up, like perhaps external sources of happiness like stand up. When I had a bad year in stand up, I actually went on antidepressants. And they made me manic, fat, and I couldn't feel like I couldn't come. I just couldn't feel, went to the doctor and they're like, hey, I'm fat and I can't come. And he's like, oh, 
is ejaculating important to you? I was like, uh, yeah, man. It's, uh, it's one of my core values. So uh, honesty, integrity, and coming. Then it's, really good. it's actually on our family crest. It's a hawk, a hammer, and a dick with cum coming out of it. Scrawled on there like a toilet wall. For some reason, men love drawing dicks on toilet walls, don't we? Every fucking toilet is like, I'm going to draw another dick. Women, do you draw vaginas on your toilet walls? You see the difference in thinking? To be fair, if you did, you'd be like, what is that, a custard tart? Like, there's no, like, no, but there's no universal, you know what I mean? Like, this looks like a dick, that looks like a dick, dick, dick. Maybe that's how it started. They were like, oh, everything looks like a dick, let the dick people run things. I don't know. I don't know, maybe a symbolised version of vagina is part of the movement. But anyway, I'll leave that to you to discuss after the show. I'm not telling you what to do. Now I think like trying to be bigger as a comedian, like trying to make it, is so attached to my happiness. And you know, it's a feeling of becoming irrelevant. Like it doesn't matter, I've been doing stand-up for 14 years and it just doesn't matter if you're not famous. If you don't sell enough tickets, it's really... It's like you're screaming in a closet, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, I felt the same way uh, when I was worked in an office, like you're just so replaceable. I used to hate my office. I've worked in IT support. <laughs> I got fired for turning up on magic mushrooms, if I'm honest. <laughs> Which is fucking dumb, because it made me better at my job. Uh, I could, um, you know, feel the printer. <laughs> Another one, fuck me. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I remember my boss used to make me feel like he'd come up to me and go, oh, Damien, how come we haven't changed the toner cartridge in the printer? I was like, oh, I didn't know it needed changing. He goes, it does, you're letting the whole team down. And just storms off. Now, oh, am I going to confront him? Of course not, I'm going to get fired, I'm irreplaceable. Come up and go, what the fuck do you say? Come here and say it. Come here. You know, I get all to walk around and fuck, come here and say it. Fuck yeah. I just got to, I was like, oh, sorry, man, excuse me. I'm sorry, I'll get on that. And the revenge fantasies begin. <laughs> Everyone in this room's got a revenge fantasy about someone right now. They said that to me. How could they? You know, when Tim, next time I see, like, the revenge fantasies, fucking him, I'm going to tell him, I'm going to grab him and say to him, I quit, like, oh, he's fine. And they grow over the week. The fantasies, the longer you don't see them, they grow. Don't they? I'm going to kill his family. I'm going to kill his family. I'm going to leave a different coloured toner cartridge on everybody. I'm going to save Cyan for him. I'm going to fucking save Cyan for him. You're tossing and turning, leaving, losing. Your girlfriend's like, you were screaming last night. Something about the magenta murderer. exactly the same way about stand-up. Honestly, I do. I just feel like something... This is going to seem so fucking dumb, I think. But it's just... I got, uh, you know... I recently got off of my first cruise ship gig. Which is a, you know... Yeah, I know. It's, uh, it's really where you end up when you're irrelevant. And, uh, no, I know people I hate when I say that, you know. It's like comedians are like, oh... Fucking saw your show, man. Having to go out the Pacific Jewel. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, hey, no, no, tell me, man. What the fuck's wrong with the Pacific Jewel? <laughs> exactly. I'm like nothing. It's my favourite floating cultural genocide. <laughs> <laughs> Some of my favourite comics and best friends are on the cruise ships, and because now they're on them, they want me on them. Because they're on them. It's like the ship of the dead in Pirates of the Caribbean. You know there's a ghost ship where all the pirates are dead and the ships are ghosts? They're, like, they're beckoning me. They're, they're like beckoning me, join us. Join us on the cruise ships. Give up your career and come on the cruise ships. There's a buffet. Join us. One of my friends, I said, oh, I'm thinking about going on the cruise ships. He was so, he was so wanted me on them. He was like, oh, dude, I saw a rainbow once. I saw a rainbow in the ocean. Like, oh, wow, man. Join us, you might have to do a kid show. Why are you working with kids? International waters, there's a loophole. Join us! Join us! And I'm at this stage in my career, you know, I'm on the shoreline going fucking... Uh, not yet, I've still got business with the living. Let me finish that before I get on the ship of the dead. 
it's, uh, it's suck and dump. You know, what it is, is, is that it's, you know, like I, 14 years I've been doing stand-up and we never, look, it's just not what I, where I expected to be. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed to be having those offers. I'm just, it's not what I dream. Do you ever wonder where the notion of following your dreams, which I believe is almost a religion now, we just drilled it every day, follow your dreams, follow your dreams. Every major corporate interest wants us desperately to follow our dreams. Have you noticed that? Toyota hasn't had it at the moment. Your dreams, it's got a kid pushing a bike up a hill. Dreams are hard, and then you start, and then you, you know, yeah, and then it's him older, like, yay, I'm a bike person now. Toyota, struggle for you. Every ad's like, we create your dreams. Your dreams are important to us. You've got to live your dreams, your dreams, dreams. Make sure you're following your dreams. Buy more shoes because you want to jump like Michael Jordan and dream. You want to be, every, every fucking ad's like, follow your dreams. We create dreams. What are your dreams? You want to fulfill your dreams. We'll give you the bank loan because it keeps you in a state of consumption because you're constantly going like, oh, I need this. I need that. I need to buy the shoes. I need to get the bank loan. I need to do this. I'm constantly following, following, following. So you're never happy with what you got. It's perfect religion for the consumer society. You know an ad you'll never see? Everything's fine. <laughs> Samsung. <laughs> you know, like everything's okay. Like even when I say that in the room, everything's fine. Everything's okay. You've got everything you need. You're fine. You look great. Honestly, you look fucking great. Everything's okay. This is the best we've got right now in this moment. This is it. Everything's fine. Toilet duck, a family company. Like, <laughs> Sometimes when I say in the room, I feel like people are like, oh yeah, because we never see that. Because we're constantly bombarded with, you can be on holidays, you can have a car. And we wonder why so many people arrive at their dreams and feel completely empty. I had that experience recently. Ever since I started comedy, I wanted to be on TV with Dave Hughes. That was like the fucking thing when I started. I was like, one day I'll be on TV with Dave Hughes. And that happened recently. I got to audition for Hughes, we got a problem, which is a panel show where Hughes goes, what's your problem? And comedians riff off problems in their life. And I got to audition, which means a taping of the show, whether it airs or not, whatever. But I got to do it. And he, and I, like, what my idea of funny is, is he's is, is really fucked shit. <laughs> and he was like, oh, what's your, what's your problem? And I was like, oh, I was molested. <laughs> nothing, just nothing like that. It was like that, just nothing like that. That is fucking hilarious. Are you kidding me? That's the funniest shit anyone's ever said on this show. The producer pulled me out and said, that you're too intense. <laughs> for this show. You know, I was like, fuck, maybe this isn't even what I want. <laughs> is this where I'm going to, is this the platform? I don't know. And then I had Triple M. Triple M Breakfast had a new radio host, Triple M in Brisbane, and they switched breakfast hosts. They called me up to come in and audition for the role. Be triple the money I earn, billboards, TV, media personality. I'm like, this is it. And they made me do a prank call to see if I could improvise in the audition. So I had to call up and pretend I was a fucking plumber. <laughs> I had to call up and pretend I was a plumber who'd done a bad job. I had to put on my radio voice. Yeah, g'day, this is Trevor. Yeah, g'day, Trevor. How's it going? <laughs> yeah, look, uh, this is John, the plumber, who came in the morning, mate. Uh, yeah, look, we took a look at those pipes. You reckon, I don't know, mate, about 300 grand damage? What? 300 grand, mate? You're fucking kidding yourself. 300 grand? Yeah, mate, 300 grand. We've already started work. What? You can't come onto my property without my permission, mate. Just kidding, mate. <laughs> Just kidding, mate. We got gotcha. you. It's Damo. It's Damo from Triple M Breakfast. Oh, Damo, you fucking bastard. <laughs> you bastard. You got me. <laughs> you bloody got me, you bastard. Jesus. How did you get my number? You molested me, mate. <laughs> Gotcha. <laughs> we have gotcha, the police are coming. Um, Did you get um, the job? No, I didn't get the job. <laughs> I will never be on that station again. Isn't exactly what happened, but very similar. Mm. No, I sabotaged it. Not on purpose, but I just did. I don't know. That's the thing. It's like when I actually got the thing, and I was like, I don't even want this now. And I've spent 14 years trying to get there. You know something really interesting that happened to me recently? My brother, so my brother, my brother won the world championship in IndyCar, the ultimate Western dream, like the trophy, the whole thing. And uh, he said, you know what, I'm not happy. 
He finally got it. He's like, you know what? I'm, I'm still not happy. And I was like, of course. They don't give you the trophy and the metaphysical concept of your dad's approval. <laughs> you don't get like an orb. You don't get the inside thing. You know what I mean? You're like, yeah, and then like an orb. I don't have to bah anymore. <laughs> I don't have to die anymore. Because we don't focus on the inside stuff, the intrinsic values. You know, it's, um, it's, it's almost like we're so focused on our dreams now and, and our careers and all these external things to fulfillment, fame, uh, your job, career prospects, property, a car, how you look, Instagram followers, whatever it is. We look at all these extrinsic things, the shadows on the wall for fulfillment. And over and over and over again, we arrive at them and they don't make us happy. I have so many friends that are so fucking successful and deeply, deeply sad. Because, honestly, like, as a society, I believe the reason is because we, we, do, we just don't value intrinsic values anymore. They're just not a priority. I'm talking about, like, honesty, integrity, compassion, empathy, hard work, uh, uh, be, caring for other people, doing things for other people. These intrinsic values, community, family, I put so far down the list in our society that without these intrinsic values, you can arrive at your ultimate fantasies and feel completely empty. These values that were passed down through stories and beliefs and rituals that we've lost as a, as a culture. It's not like so black and white, like you've got to quit your dreams. It's more like a, I feel like a battle because we sacrifice these intrinsic things all the time for these, these things. Like I sacrifice seeing my son to do stand-up all the time. And it's like a battle. It's like a battle or a balance. But I honestly believe that if these intrinsic ones, if you can, if you can just, if these can win, those intrinsic values of being a good person, if they can win over, over these, these shadows, I honestly believe you can, you can step away from your shadows or illusions and dreams and beliefs that you believe will fulfill you. You can, you can step away from, from them into a, into a deeper truth. Thank you. You guys are doing great.